Well, uh, good afternoon. Uh, it is just afternoon. Uh, I'm Lance J. Brown, the president of the Consortium for Sustainable Urbanization. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to this week's event, uh, a special event in a year-long series of discussions with thought leaders around the world on our progress towards our greater, greener cities for all. The program is, a, is special because the month of October has been designated by the United Nations as Urban October, and also designated in New York as Arctober, a month of special days devoted to architecture and urban design in New York and elsewhere. The consortium is pleased to add this special Green City session in support of these annual events. And for those interested, you might visit the AIA New York calendar, which lists many other events ongoing during the month. It's also special because we have two speakers talking about their recent books on our ever urbanizing environment rather than a discourse on one city. Our speakers today, Harrison Fraker and Doug Kelbau, are thought leaders in planning and design initiatives, and it's my great pleasure to welcome them and moderate today's program. A special note for those AIA members attending, if you stay for a nice 45 minutes, you can then apply for one learning unit as instructed for self-reporting in the original program invitation. Please check back to it. For those joining us for the first time, uh, the organizers of this series, the CSU, Consortium for Sustainable Urbanization, is devoted to building bridges between the United Nations and civil society, the design professions, businesses, academia, and allied organizations. The CSU mission ranges from increasing awareness about emerging issues, facilitating knowledge transfer between and among policy and decision makers, and fostering connections, cooperation, and collaboration, while all the time promoting the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals represented by this lapel pin with its 17 colors. This is easy to find, UN SDGs online. We especially support goal 11 cities and uh, communities, as well as the new urban agenda adopted in uh, 2016 at the Habitat 3 meeting in Quito, and the very recently released report, uh, Our Common Agenda. In the spirit of collaboration, we want to make sure we thank all of today's program partners, and specifically uh, the UN Habitat New York office, the AIA New York chapter, the UN Habitat Professional Forum, the NGO Committee on Sustainable Development New York, Columbia University Center for Buildings, Infrastructure, and Public Space, CEL, the Creative Exchange Lab, Lab and our newest partner, Global Urban Development, GUD. And with most sincere thanks, the Office of Perkins Beesman and their entire team in New York and Washington for their long-term ongoing support of the CSU and for providing the platform for the Green City series. I want to give special thanks to Rick Bell, who's with us, good friend, good colleague, dynamic board member for spearheading the year's Green Cities series. I invite you to visit our CSU website, see our resources, see our publications, check our upcoming events, including next month's Green Cities event about yet another city and looking forward to December uh, talking about Singapore. To the program, I'm very pleased and excited. I'm really excited to open this program. Given the UN Secretary General's recent declaration that it is now a code red moment, the world is hot. Uh, and the UN Habitat Executive Director's declaration, it's an all hands on deck moment, and we are all hands. What we'll discuss today is central to their concerns. So I'm going to introduce the two authors who will each share their key points from their separate works following their comments we will have a discussion with a special focus on the overlap of their concerns and thoughts, the public realm. Harrison Fraker received his MFA in architecture from Princeton and Cambridge universities. His teaching practice and research spanned 50 years, uh, first as chair and then founding dean at the University of Minnesota, and finally as the fifth dean of the College of Environmental Design at UC Berkeley. He's received major design awards, he received the 2014 Topaz Medallion, mark that, and his Oakland EcoBlock project was chosen as a top 10 transformative project by Scientific American. 
Harrison uh, is rather expert in everything to do with Scandinavia as well as the U.S. And his most recent book, Minding the City, co-authored with Sjöström and Anataska Poteva, will be discussed today. Doug Kelbau received a B.A. magna cum laude for, and an uh, M.R. degree from Princeton. He led Kelbau and Lee Architects, an architecture firm that won 15 design awards and competitions. He was then architecture chair at the at UWASH, University of Washington, and then the dean at the University of Michigan. He wanted to become VP of design and planning for a development company in Dubai, working on major projects in the Middle East and around the world. In 2016, he was awarded the 2016 Topaz Medallion Award. And he's authored any number of books, including The Early Pedestrian po Pocket, co-authored with Peter Calthorpe, and his most recent book, The Urban Fix, he'll discuss again today. I should add on a, a somewhat more personal note that the three of us participating in today's program are old friends and colleagues. We, we all met at Princeton in the 1960s, some later, uh, later in the decade. Kelbaugh was a student of mine. I take particular pride in his joining with Fraker and I as a Topaz laureate. I guess I should note that in 20, oh, because in 2007, I got that, that award as well. So we three Topaz laureates, I think if it's, it's of note that we all came of age at a time when Rachel Carson, Jane Jacobs, Stuart Brand, uh, Whole Earth Catalog, and the first Earth Day and other critical persons, actions, and legislation emerged and alerted us to the global environmental concerns that we each adapted as part of our long-term professional and personal portfolios, brings us to today. I know that there will be many questions and comments for our speakers. Please use the WebEx chat function to submit questions and comments, and we'll do our best to reply, time permitting. And now I'm going to give you our first author and distinguished colleague, Doug Kalbaugh, over to you, Doug. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Lance, and good, good morning, morning everybody. everybody. I'm, I'm going to talk about the urban, urban heat island. island. Uh, and as you can see from this first slide, it's always hotter in cities and in their surrounding hinterland. Next. A second, Doug, I've got to get this on. Oh. You good to go? Yeah, I'm good to go. Can you see it? No. But that's all right. I'll follow on my slides. Lance, can you see it? Not yet. No. Jeez, what the heck happened? Let's go oh, back. Pony. I think you can, if you want, you can work on getting up the slides and we can catch up if that's okay with Doug. Okay. Or you want me to keep I'm talking? I'm going to share my screen again. Yeah. If if you can give the introductory comments again about you know Doug that then we can catch up with the images if that works for you. All right. Well, I'll, yes, the urban heat island describes this phenomenon where cities are hotter at their core and cooler uh, in the in their peripheries, a good bit hotter. You know, 10, 20 degrees, uh, and it's because of the buildup of so-called sensible heat. These are from hot tailpipes and chimneys, from dark surfaces heated up by the sun. Uh, it's not the same thing as the greenhouse heating of the atmosphere. It's not climate change. It's a local phenomenon, not a global phenomenon. And it's a double whammy because cities are getting the greenhouse effect of global warming and the heat island effect. There are a lot of impacts um, from the heat island. There are vector-borne diseases. So you uh, still can see the term on child right? health. It's tough on mental health, cuts worker productivity, um, et cetera. And large cities tend to be warming at more than twice the rate of the planet, of the planet as a whole, as a result of the loss of naturally vegetated land covers. Global estimates of climate change are likely to underestimate rates of warming in the very places where most um, Lance, can you see it now? I do. Great. Thank you. Here we go. Finally. So, Doug, I'll catch up to you. All right. Um, is this what you want? I'll keep going. One more. Okay. 
One more, one more. Okay, look at this Philadelphia streetscape, which is getting hotter and wetter due to climate change. Some neighborhoods can be as much as 22 degrees Fahrenheit hotter than others. Uh, just look on this street uh, next to the tree on the left, it's 84. And out here in the middle, it's 117 degrees. It's dramatic. Next. And of course, it affects poorer neighborhoods much more. This is Oakland near where Harrison lives. On the left is the surface temperatures and on the right is where income is measured. And you can see it's much hotter in the poorer areas, which are lighter green on the right. Next. Uh, the heat wave in uh, Western Europe in 2003 uh, killed about 45,000. Uh, a more recent one, 54,000. The average American experienced about four dangerously humid days between 1981 and, nine, and 2010, but now, or by 2030, it's expected to double to about 10 days per summer. And I just read this yesterday in the New York Times. The city of Seville in Spain is plans uh, to become the first major city in the world to start naming and categorizing heat waves like we do with hurricanes and other tropical storms. Uh, interesting development. Next. This shows a map of Africa where uh, heat waves are really bad. Uh, they caused 91% of extreme temperature deaths in the past two decades and it'll be uh, an especially pronounced problem in Africa where almost a billion people live now. Next. This is a gradient across the city. You can just see how much hotter the paved inner city is on the left and cooler the countryside on the right. Next. <clears throat> Parking lots are a big problem. We have lots of them, particularly in suburbia. They get very hot. Although we're starting in some cases to paint them white. Asphalt can get <coughs> so hot it melts. Next. Uh, here's the delta in temperature between urban and rural, uh, which is a function of two things primarily. How light the surface color is, the albedo as it's called, which is determines how much heat is reflected uh, versus waste heat which is simply hot air coming out of uh, automobile and truck tailpipes and local chimneys. So it's, um, it's a function of these two things and uh, it's getting worse. Next, this shows in a weird map uh, stretched east to west, what parts of the country are most endangered? You see the Southwest, the Midwest, and then New England corridor, New York, New Jersey, et cetera. Next. He related deaths around the world increased by 74% from 1980 to 2016. Uh, more than 356,000 people died from extreme heat related causes in just nine countries in 2019. The death toll is expected to grow as temperatures increase. It's a bigger deal in some ways than um, COVID. Well, it's a long, much bigger long-term problem, much bigger. But we're lucky because strategies to mitigate and adapt to urban heat islands are consistent with strategies to deal with climate change. So lucky. If it was the reverse, we'd be in big trouble. Next. How might heat islands actually help? I argue in my book because urban heat islands are a manageable problem that can be dealt with in five to 10 years rather than 50 to 100 years like climate change, it can better motivate people to modify their behavior. There's more immediate and more palpable feedback. But we don't want to scare people away from the city for other reasons. So the way you deal with these uh, heat islands is, first of all, you have lighter colored roofs, pavements, and walls, the albedo enhancement. You know, a, a white surface reflects four times as much solar energy as a dark surface next. Uh, and let's make our roads a bit smaller. Uh, let's start depaving these roads and putting gravel in where the parking strips are, et cetera, next. Uh, the simplest 
passive solar, solar technology white paint. There are new white paints out now that are super reflective, four times better than a dark roof. Here are some students from Princeton, which Harrison and I, and I see Bob Geddes and um, a lot of other Princetonians on this, including good old Aaron Marcus. Uh, here are some engineering students up in New York City uh, painting uh, a roof white, which cuts the uh, mortality risk in the area. And, it doesn't cool the building below it because it's a well insulated roof, but it cools the neighborhood around it by about a degree next. Uh, this is our roof in Ann Arbor, which we recently moved from back to Seattle, but we have solar hot water and solar uh, PVs on the roof and the roof is white next. A second strategy um, is uh, just less waste heat. Um, you know, more efficient air conditioners, which, as you know, reject heat into the air, uh, more efficient cars, and so on. Next, uh, air conditioning is a big problem because it pumps hot air into the streets, um, and uh, it's sensible heat to deal with heat waves made more frequent by climate change. The number of AC units is expected to more than triple worldwide by 2050. As well as guzzling huge amounts of electricity, AC units contain refrigerants that are potent greenhouse gases. It's a fast growing problem. And having lived in the Middle East for a while, I can tell you air conditioning is needed and we're not giving it up. Fans, though, are great. Good old electric fans make a lot of sense. They're much, much, much more efficient than air conditioners. Next. <clears throat> the third strategy is opening up and ventilating building canyons. More uh, urban breezes are can flow through. And here, here's an urban section. You know, you've got the width of the street, the height of the buildings around it, and the surface colors and the amount of air that can circulate easily and so on. You want light colored surfaces on the walls of the street canyon, the street facades as well. And th this is a possible way to next. Uh, Harrison developed this, it's in his book, uh, a way to cool a street in New York City by reducing, you know, by shading it essentially and having these beautiful hanging gardens that also evapotranspire and provide lots of other benefits next. Uh, and then cool microclimates, trees are so, so important next. Here's a list of the wonderful, many, multiple things that trees do. Uh, I'm not going to read them, but uh, it, it's just everything from reducing crime to soothing the psyche and providing cool shade and sequestering CO2. Next. Uh, what a difference on the left versus on the right. Trees are just wonderful. Next. Uh, Replacing, you know, you, you can reduce a lot of air conditioning. You can save a lot of money with trees. Next. Uh, this is a slide uh, in Saigon. Uh, urban trees grow bigger. Uh, on the right is actually South uh, Brazil or Argentina. They, uh, trees mitigate climate change 16 times more than non-urban trees. Urban trees are bigger. They have less competition than in a forest. In Metro Chicago, they provide an estimated $350 million of value in annual carbon storage. And uh, the estimated value of its uh, urban tree canopy is over $50 billion. Next. A number of cities in the U.S. have adopted canopy goals. Providence, Baltimore, Chattanooga, Chicago. D.C. Uh, has a citywide 40% tree, tree canopy goal. Um, so they have to plant a lot of trees, which they are doing next. Uh, last, my book, The Urban Fix, Resilient Cities in the War Against Climate Change, Heat Islands and Overpopulation. You can get at Routledge or Taylor and Francis and use this discount uh, code to get 20% off. Over to you, Harrison. Okay, everybody, I'm going to try to get my slides up. I hope everybody can see these. Can you all see these, Lance? Uh, very good. It's a very good, Harrison. Great. So um, 
Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here with both Lance and Doug. Uh, I really admire Doug's book. It's, it's in part why I wrote my book. Um, but why write a book about mind and meaning in the city when we have such an existential threat from climate change? And um, I just wanted to go over some of my motivation here. First of all, I've had a career long interest in perception and cognition uh, from a theory course that I taught at Princeton in the 70s. Um, the other thing that has upset me is the idea of aesthetics and sensorial and the visceral experience of the city have been largely missing or hidden in the discourse on sustainable urban design, which has been preoccupied with big data, mapping, abstract figure ground representation, and systems as a technical fix. In fact, my first book um, is all about uh, the integration of technical systems to make a difference about transportation, energy, water, waste, and how to make uh, neighborhoods sustainable. But because of these things that were missing or hidden, um, I've been very interested in neuroscience and I, all, I recommend Sarah Robinson's book about mind and architecture. And from that book, which uh, has chapters by neuroscientists and theorists, um, it can be argued that urban design should be redirected towards the more emergent, the effective, the sensual or sensory, the gestural and the kinesthetic. Uh, there are two final things that really motivated this book, which is the idea that public space is a incredibly uh, complex and interesting in environmental performance. And it's very underdeveloped. Most of our streets are just generic um, systems that are done by various agencies in the city. And it really hasn't recognize that public space is a tremendous design opportunity that can really uh, capture the sensory and aesthetic potential of sustainable systems. So what are the insights from neuroscience? I'll go through them quickly. First of all, neuroscience has from their neuroimaging shows that the idea and appreciation of art is as fundamental as love because it occurs in the hedonic pleasure circuit. And what this really means is that the primary uh, desire uh, for meaning um, is relevant to every participant in the city. In fact, when I was in Chicago at the ULI and had a discussion with the Astor Gates, in many cases, it's the uh, meaningful and poetic relationship to neighborhoods that all of poor uh, residents have. It's what they value the most. Also, they've discovered mirror neurons, and these are really important because when we look at a cup, it's not just a visual experience. It, act it, it activates neurons in the motor and premotor cort cortical areas that would be activated if we actually picked up the cup, held it, and drank from it. And the slides on the right just are some examples of how we empathize with uh, the struggle uh, in the snake by, uh, sculpture by Michelangelo, we empathize with dance, we feel the weight of the Magritte painting, we feel the cut and slump, and even the process of uh, this installation art by Matta Clark, and then finally the process in the painting at the bottom. The other thing that's really interesting about the social dimension is that meaning comes from the possibilities for experience, both actual and simulated, that um, a space or a place or an object affords us. So therefore, meaning is not an abstract, disembodied, conceptual idea. It's rather involved neural simulation of the senses, the motor and effective processes that we associate with a thing. These are really important. We have different kinds of attention, very narrow, uh, focused is the prerogative of the left, broad, the right. We alternate between these uh, when we're trying to understand our relationship to the world. And there's a natural hierarchy. It turns out global attention comes first 
And then we try to sort out why. And this is why Merleau Ponty has said, all our senses work together. There are also other important things. We develop over the course of our lives, probably even in the womb, certain schemata and an embodied form. And they're based on the body. We understand containment. We understand verticality. We understand balance. We understand forces. We understand motion all through our bodies. These are not abstract concepts. They're embodied in our experience of the world. Also, we've developed form concepts over time. And these are just some classical ones. And we understand the process by which it's made. A point becomes a line when you move it. A line becomes a plane when you shift it. The plane becomes a volume when you shift it. We have notions of additive and subtractive forms. There's some examples on the right. The Guathmi house is subtractive. Uh, the Charles Moore um, condominium at Sea Ranch, it has additive things on it. And then, of course, we really understand um, and can imagine the process by which a form has been conceived. These are Eisenman's transformations. But this is uh, Diller Scofidio's fold, which you can see in the museum in Boston. So um, what this really tells us when we get to urban space, that um, these places are much more than a technical fix. This is a little Paley Park. It's quite an old and traditional place, but it is rich in illustrating the insights from neuroscience. You have empathy. Um, we, we really appreciate the entry forecourt on the sidewalk and street embodied by our uh, arms. We also appreciate the room as closure. It affords all kinds of ways of sitting and occupying the space. There's an immensely rich environmental performance. There's shade, evaporative cooling, and evapotranspiration from the green walls. There's an immensely rich sensory engagement. There's the sound of the water, the smell of the plants, the touch of the materials, the feel on the skin of the evap evaporation and the dappled light. All of these things are um, an amazing uh, relief from the city. And this uh, just answers our primal need for a meaningful and uh, beautiful place. So this is your time. Really your time's half up. Okay, I'm almost there. I'll go quickly. Same can be done uh, with the Scarpa Biennale uh, courtyard. I won't go through it in detail. You can look in the book. It has these amazing sensory things. But one of the things that's spectacular is when you have this fountain, it tinkles on a copper lily, but then there's a visual echo of that on the underneath soffit. It creates shade and light, microclimates. You can choose where you want to go. It's a, a wonderful relief from the Biennale galleries. So what about, how does this all relate to concepts of public space? You know, our discipline has thought of public space as a formal spatial performance, both the old city and the modern city, the space of social performance, um, as you can see in this diagram, the space for trans transit performance and the movement for green streets. And also it is the place for infrastructure. In the past, hidden and buried and a throughput idea is emerging into the idea that we retain and reuse these elements of infrastructure. Doug has pointed out all the amazing functions um, that uh, trees provide. I would argue that public space in general has all of these productive functions. Microclimate, air quality, CO2 absorption, storm water treatment, wastewater treatment, food, habitat, energy, aesthetics, health and well-being are all enhanced if uh, the public space is designed properly. And then obviously it has been a community place, a recreation place, and a place for transportation. Trouble is, it's been looked at primarily in plan. When you look at it in section, you suddenly realize all of the opportunities that this provides. The floors can be rethought, and you can see all the eco functions on the right. I won't repeat them, but every single one of the pictures 
um, fulfills these eco functions. So the floors can be transformed, walls can be rethought, as Doug has shown. These are green examples. And the canopies, trees are fabulous, as Doug has illustrated. But so are fabric canopies, so are living canopies, and so are canopies that generate energy. The same with the roofs, the white roof, the shaded roof, the garden, and then a neighborhood of roofs. And all of these have the ability to transform the aesthetic and social value of the city. We did a couple of quick studies of iconic places. The trouble uh, with a Plaza Real in Barcelona is it's uninhabitable most of the day because all of the surfaces absorb heat and make it too hot. So we created a canopy uh, that generates energy that shades the facades of the buildings. We have a um, canvas shade for the south part and then we put an orchard back in the place which was there originally all to show to provoke the idea that we can remake these places that will make them even more livable the same with harlem harlem can become an oasis for this community with uh, trees and reworking the street dealing with stormwater differently and then shading the bull the avenues uh, during the day and opening at night and finally, you can even turn some of these wide streets in, in New York into power plants, but they have this added effect of being a shading device, creating a hanging garden, really making the river to river experience of the city a magical place that does all of these technical things as well. So if you're interested, I think all of these ideas create a whole new toolbox. It unlocks the creative and sensorial and poetic potential embedded in sustainable systems, a whole new urban design toolbox. And this book tries, uh, because it's a, really a record of field notes on how to unlock this, um, really urge that you get it. You can get it from Oro Editions. There are eight case studies that demonstrate the lessons from neuroscience. And then there are eight examples of designs that try to capture that poetic potential. So, uh, hope you enjoyed this. Let's open it up for questions. Um, listen, thank you. Thank you very much, Doug and Harrison. I, I do want to share with you the fact that these books are both uh, wonderful compendiums of the information presented. They're, they're in some ways encyclopedic, meaning they have the capacity to be used as both information and reference. I think you saw that in the illustrations um, proposed. I have a couple of quick observations before I go to, to um, our first question, a good yes and no question. Um, the, the, the observations I have are the progress that starts, and I think both of you referred to them, and they go more or less from Camilo Cite uh, in the aesthetics of the city, written maybe over 100 years ago with his great fear that the sensibilities, I think many of those referred to by Harrison, were going to be removed, subsumed, eliminated by the automobile. And even though we've not really spent a lot of time right now talking about the automobile, let's face it, it has invaded and succeeded our rights of way and our streets ubiquitously around the world. So that's, a, that's an issue to be discussed going forward from that. We all know the recent work of, of the Danish uh, urbanist uh, Jan Gale, who in much of his work has actually tried to manage that automobile, even right here in New York City, uh, instituting new kinds of lane markings, sharing of the road, which is another issue, which the sharing of the public space that Doug and Pony have talked about. I don't know if any of you saw the recent article in the Times about the absolute chaos in Paris on the closing of streets to traffic, but the lack of rules for bikes and uh, scooters and inline and uh, pedestrians. So it's a whole other thing. Um, I also think I would like to make a reference, this is uh, from an old student, to a fellow named Ed Bai. I would wonder, Harrison, if you came across the work of Ed Bai, but in terms of discussing the sensibilities of the landscape, he certainly was the first person I ever heard who used phraseology similar to that that you used, which was subjective emotive, but connected to the objective in the sciences. So, you know, there is a, there's a wonderful stream. I think it comes more through landscape than architecture in that regard, um, giving fair, fair credit. 
uh, for Doug. Um, in addition to Seville having named um, the, the heat waves, the city of Phoenix uh, in this country just appointed its first director of heat effects in the city, a, a whole new department which other cities will follow to actually try to manage what, what you put your finger on. So in the big picture of things, Doug talked very much about the physical realities of uh, excessive heat, and I think the attendant uh, environmental and climate change issues, the hard issues, all somewhat external to the inside of things. And uh, Harrison talked about the spaces that we inhabit themselves between those buildings. Um, I think of Jan Gale's book, uh, short book, Close Encounters with Buildings, which he talks, he talks about space, but he understands that space is often defined by the buildings. So open space and buildings get married, and they get married in the public realm, which I think is the focus of this. So I have one question before I go to the very good uh, guest question. Uh, I just finished uh, writing a piece that talks about how we're going to progress as temperature rises. What was it? 117 degrees in Portugal. Uh, those uh, places in the world that have traditionally had uh, uh, siestas in the afternoon, the new movie, Reminiscence, which takes place where everything has shifted to night because it's just too darn hot during the day. Do either of you in the work that you've done relative to this, and especially, Doug, given your tenure in Dubai, where I know as I walked around in that part of the world, you go out at night, there's people having a picnic at 11 o'clock at night and it's just too hot in the day. How does the work that you just discussed translate as we potentially shift from living more in the day to potentially shift living more at night? Or do you think that that is a, a, a topic that, that will never surface? So, you know, Doug, Harrison, whoever. Uh, I, I think, think you're right. I think people will shift. shift. Much, much of our life, life. Uh, uh, cooler times of the day, uh, which is the evening and the night. Yeah, and we certainly, I certainly witnessed that in Dubai. Um, I live in Seattle now, which isn't so hot, so I'm not seeing it, but um, New York, you must be seeing it, Lance. We, 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 we always have. I, I noticed in the Dubai Expo, Doug, the Dubai, Dubai Expo is declared open until 2 a.m. in the morning. Most of really? these world expos, it's 8 o'clock, 10 o'clock would be late. They've decided, given current events, they have to be open till 2 if they want to, people to be able to visit. Interesting. So, so the interesting thing there um, is if you look at the physics of this, more and more, um, the nighttime is not going to be uh, comfortable because the heat is retained in the thermal mass of the buildings and the streets if it's not shaded. And um, therefore, you can still have temperatures, especially outside, because uh, you're getting all this re-radiated um, energy and heat. So, you, you know, you're gonna have to wait till midnight or two if it even does cool down enough to be outside. <laughs> So well, it definitely cools down in places like Dubai. Yeah. Um, because the heat is really excessive in the afternoon. Um, but you're right. There is that thermal lag, that flywheel effect mm -hmm. of the built environment. But in, in humid cities, it's worse than in a city like Phoenix, where it's, the air is dry and the sky is clear, you radiate heat much faster into the into outer space than you do in a place like New York. So it depends on the local climate as well. Yeah, and that's why I showed the moving shading device over the avenues in New York, just as an idea, because you do want the night sky. But the, the point here, I think, Lance, going back to your streets question and the whole notion that the urban section and the things we've talked about really mean rethinking entirely, remaking these streets. You know, if you think back in history, there, uh, there, I can cite two moments where cities were transformed by remaking the streets. Think of Sixtus V uh, in Rome, those amazing openings that he made 
and think of uh, Paris and uh, you know the streets that were opened up in Paris. These strategies can be used in a design way which are just as dramatic. They can remake the city if you pick a corridor to really turn into a special place, just like uh, the Sixtus the Fifth Rome, you know, or uh, the boulevards in Paris. Um, and these would be oases in the city. It would attract people because they would be environmentally different. You can't do the whole city, um, although you could come co close if you really tried to um, change the tree canopy. But these would immediately, as Doug has said, be places that uh, would attract people. Now, you, you know, th this idea of the streets, the right of way and the openings, I don't know, there's that wonderful book on streets that was produced by Juan Close as the ED of UN Habitat, talking about cities. And I don't know if I want to call them Western versus non-Western or Northern versus Southern, because they really are richer versus poorer in many res respects. But the city of New York, I think, has 36% of its surface area in streets. Right. And, and a, a favela uh, like Rosinha in Rio de Janeiro has 3 to 5% of its area devoted to streets. So part of what we're discussing in the big picture of things with however much, you know, 2 billion people uh, potentially living in those less developed areas or, or less managed, less well managed areas, you know, we have to, you know, what, what is the ubiquity? of the commentary we're having is it is it translatable what are the what are the parts that translate beyond one context of, of a new york or a western developed city to a less or a more developing location and that that's kind of a rhetorical question um and and i'll i'll leave it for the for the moment as rhetorical um and and perhaps go to a question that was posed by jessica morris I'm going to read it because it's a dense question, beautifully phrased, and it has, she ends it by saying it's a yes or no question. So you can use it in, as a springboard, or you can try and just respond to the, to the essence of it. I, I, I read it twice to get it, but it was, and it was directed to you, Harrison. Do you see the neural point of view that you've proposed? as being relevant to the potential alignment of preservation paradigms. I'm reading that as, you know, as she said, memory and authentic place. So we've got that. We've got existing places with, a, let's say, cultural uh, continuity. And built environment climate action paradigms, biophysiological balance uh, optimization, which might require, I guess, change. Do you see that the, the first as a value proposition for sustainable development based on the co-benefits, including a depth of aesthetic valuation and economics once removed? So I, I, I kind of get her sense of, of these, you know, this this test between what is and what could be and the fit between the two. I hope I've represented it correctly in terms of her uh, interpreting her her meaning and, and uh, over to you in terms of, of uh, a, a response. Well, I think the the implication of my book is uh, really aligns those two things. We are not going to meet our goals if we don't seriously deal with repairing our cities and doing major retrofit of all our existing buildings. And if we do them with the sustainable integrated systems, but we do them in a way that um, it is an opportunity to make the places more meaningful. I think it's a immense opportunity for the design professions interdisciplinarily, landscape architects, urban designers to really pay attention to how we repair not only our streets, but our buildings. Um, and this can not only help solve the global warming and climate change issues, that can also make the place literally more meaningful for even uh, the, the um, least uh, advantaged uh, neighborhoods and you know people in our cities. And that's what the whole Oakland Eco Block is about. It's showing you how to retrofit a neighborhood 
so that it is zero carbon, zero energy. Um, it makes the transition to all electric, but it also transforms the uh, sense and meaning of the neighborhood and the public realm. And that's, yeah, the kind right. of, that's the kind of thing that we can do. Doug. Well, historic preservation saves a lot of energy, which fights the bigger issue of global climate change. Yeah. Uh, there's the embodied energy in all the materials in new construction, plus the energy to build the buildings. So there's that simple basic energy savings of historic preservation, which shouldn't be overlooked. It's a big, it, it is a big deal. And while we should not be knocking down things, but uh, finding ways to repair them and repurpose them. It, it's very interesting. I was uh, at a meeting this morning where this is, issue came up. I, I won't belabor it now, but it really did have to do with uh, district, landmark districts and preservation against, you know, progressive development. And there's this push and pull between those who see the need to increase density in lower density areas and those who see the need to keep what we have that is not replicable going forward. And of course, at the core of that is what Doug said. I was at a, um, a dinner with Sir Nicholas Grimshaw, one of those great British folks, the originators of the Industrial Revolution, and given an opportunity for a kind of final word as he received the RIB gold medal, a man who was so completely uh, known for all the newness he brought, his final parting word was, we've got to stop tearing down stuff. <laughs> we've got to preserve what we can, which meant to me uh, a little bit the same as, as you said earlier, uh, Harrison, you know, there's adapt adaptation and mitigation. You might say in certain buildings, we have to mitigate rather than adapt by removal. Um, in, in that regard, another question addresses really another facet of this same issue. Um, in terms of making changes in this environment, the kinds of changes that I think you both reference, um, what, what kind of public policy approach might be more useful? Would it be incentives? Not unlike I think the mayor of New York has tried to propose in certain areas, or would it be regulations where, you know, maybe it's a little bit our COVID time. Um, you know, we, we suggest to people they get a, a, get a vaccine, and then if it doesn't work, we go and we try to pass rules and regs that, that oblige them to do so. In terms of the things you see, what, what, is, what, what, what side of that argument um, would you think would be most effective in making you know, repair? I, I think, obviously, we need both. Um, but I think we also have to deal not only with regulations, but with things like nimbyism, not in my backyard, um, which tends to reduce the number of people, the density of neighborhoods. And density is good because, A, people walk more, bike more, drive less. They live in buildings which share walls, floors, and ceilings. So they take less energy to heat and cool, et cetera. We, we all know those morphological benefits that Harrison described and is obvious to any architect or urbanist. Um, so I, I think we, density is key. I just finished Ed Glazier's new book, Survival of the City. And the one problem with density is in, er, in an era of increasing pandemics and epidemics, uh, there is more communication and more communicable disease that spreads in density. So it's a balancing act. Uh, we have we have to deal with that because, as he points out, we've always had pandemics and we always will. Um, so those are two counter forces that we have to. Consider. Well, you know, I I tell you, I would I would uh, it's a little bit almost knee jerk on my part. You know, we had a whole. CSU program earlier about health in the city, and uh, more than one uh, speaker, expert speaker, spoke about the difference between crowding and density. Crowding is a very big problem in the poorer neighborhoods, in the poorer environments where people are occupying. But density and crowding are not the same thing. We have extremely yeah. dense areas with very, very 
uh, luxurious accommodations, uh, the density is high, but the crowding is low. Then you have places where the crowding is high and the density is low. So I don't think you wanted to conflate those two. That's my view. I don't think you want no, to. No, you're absolutely right. There's a difference. It's yeah. a good point. So, so uh, back to the policy thing, Lance. Um, it's my experience, especially with trying to get all the approvals for the Oakland EcoBlock. This public space of cities, the public right of way, which includes the streets, the parking, you know, the sidewalks, the curb, maybe a little bit of green space in between. The trouble is in cities, that space and responsibility for it is shared by so many different agencies. And they don't work together and they have standards for how you do things. If you ask them to rethink that, it is really difficult. You have to show them the value of remaking the parking spaces so they retain water. You have to show them that the sidewalks could be shaded and generate energy. Uh, you also, because look who uh, occupies that space. Usually the utilities maintain either the underground electric or the over electric on poles. They have all these legal issues. You have some people doing water, some people doing sewers, some people doing streets, some people taking care of any shade trees. So it is a um, immense challenge to have these agencies see this space as the kind of opportunity that Sixtus V saw or the boulevards in Rome saw. Yet, when it's done, even if it's just improved a little bit in the poorest neighborhoods, it provides hope for those residents. So it is one of the biggest, uh, both social, political, and health things you can do for the city, is remake that you know, space. You, you know, I, I would like to give you a reference to what I consider to be um, a case study best practice, uh, something that I engendered in New York some years ago. I had uh, uh, an official of the city of Zurich come and lecture to the commissioners of a number of New York City agencies in public. Um, this, uh, this official of Zurich was the director of public space. In the city of Zurich, the director of public space is the coordinator of everything you mentioned. Yeah, that's what you need. Steam, electricity, gas, trees, rails for trolleys, overhead, benches, paving of the ground. When somebody comes Bus, to, the shelters, space, to make I any change, to make any change, all of the agencies that occupy, that operate in that space, they come together for a great coordination effort, which does a couple of things. One, it reduces the cost of all the change that's going to be made rather than 20 times the general conditions when you dig up the street, when one does it separately for each utility, they do it once. They save vast amount of money and they get to coordinate all of that. The provision being that they don't rip up public space more than some frequency. You know, you don't go into a major space in less than a, a year or, four, or maybe five years to do a major work. So all the agencies have to actually think ahead, come ahead with what they plan. So it, it's it, for those who, who are interested in this, I would refer you to the Department of Public Space in Zurich. as They've got volumes, they have beautiful books that describe the process for doing this. So I'll I think tell you who's really interested in this issue, and that is people who bicycle in cities, which I do a lot, including today. Uh, the amount of road repair work and road cuts and patches and is unbelievable. We're just continually dodging bumps uh, and cuts and, you know, it's pathetic how much our streets are cut up and how frequently. So, so uh, you know, um, along the business of making change, another question posed, not surprisingly, in the pursuit of all of this, and from your experience, especially your experience uh, more internationally, 
Uh, on the kinds of things we're talking about, primarily the responsibility of the public, public agency, or are they things that um, are going to be asked of the, the private community? Uh, uh, some public, private, you know, in New York, those of us who are here know the negotiations of the MTA and new buildings and whether you can get a new station. Very, very lengthy, very important, very tough sometimes negotiations when everybody's sharing the same space. W what's your experience with that, the, with, the, with the public private um, uh, hand, hand joining in achieving uh, a positive change? Well, my experience in looking at the case studies for my sustainable neighborhood book, the biggest difference between the US and Europe is most of the taxes come to the city first and uh, our cities are underfunded because they depend almost entirely on property taxes. But um, in Europe, all the taxes flow through the city. So the city has money and authority uh, to, to attend to these things. And our public uh, city agencies are terribly underfunded. So all they can do are these generic solutions. So somehow that needs to change. But I, I want to go back to your, um, you know, UN sustainability goals. At the in my, in the last chapter in my book, I start talking about the fact that finally, the UN habitat goals have recognized that public space, the public space of the city, is critical to um, actually achieving these sustainability goals for so many reasons, including the fact that most of the people in the world, the public space is the most important thing that they have. So it's the place we should uh, focus uh, uh, our most uh, attention. And I found that to be really exciting that that happened because before, you know, it was about housing as, as just the house and food and starvation, just about getting food to them. All of a sudden, this idea that the public space is critical to the lives of most of the world is really uh, refreshing. Uh, and I as the world I'm urbanizes. Gonna give, yeah. Doug, I'm gonna give a shout out to someone who's in attendance on the, on the attendee list, um, a colleague, friend, Oka Kopor, who uh, 30 years ago, when I, we, were, we were together at an ACSA conference in Dallas, the word sustainability was just kind of surfacing. And I don't even know if she remembers this, but I asked her if she knew what sustainability was, where it starts and how it gets activated. And, and she just married the idea that uh, uh, sustainability uh, derives from and depends upon public space. So that's the place where people come together in communion and discuss what the future is going to be. And if you don't have that public space writ however you want to in terms of a place for common communication for the common good, that the likelihood of progress would be would be uh, uh, reduced. So I, I always like to give um, Olka credit for that for that definition. It helped me. She derived that pony, you'll know, while she was on a, a, a sabbatical grant somewhere in Scandinavia, and they asked her for a definition. So she wrote a paper. Doug, over to you. Last comment for you, and then last comment for Harrison, because we're, we're running out of time. Well, the world is urbanizing fast. Uh, the planet will be 75% urbanized, I think, in the next 20 years. Uh, and obviously, as we urbanize and get denser, we need good public space. We need a good public realm. It's our outdoor living space, our outdoor living room. So it's not just the uh, quantity, but the quality of that space. Uh, you know, it has to feel morphologically comfortable, like a outdoor room, it has to have good shade and all the other things we've talked about. Um, so I think the city has a great future, but it's gonna take hard work and architects and urbanists like us need to take a lead. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Harrison. I just say, uh, Doug hit the nail on the head you know, he said uh, the city is one of our last best hopes. We have to do all the things that we need to do across all of the areas of the economy. But I really 
want to help the design professions focus on the visceral quality of the public space that they're designing to make sure that the technical solutions are more than just a fix, but they make a more meaningful place. Well, I, 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 I appreciate all, all these comments and I appreciate the fact that what we have is kind of an open conversation about an area that has basically surfaced in our lifetimes. I'm not saying we you know, created it in, out of whole cloth, but it's an ongoing conversation about what makes the city as great as it is at a time when the city is continually under debate. Will it survive? Will COVID reduce the density of cities? Will people once again try to go to the green fields? All of this is on the table and in the papers as front page every day combined with the issues of climate change. So in terms of responsibility, the, the design professions writ large, environmental, landscape, architecture, uh, industrial, they're all on the line to do amazing invention and creativity um, uh, uh, combined with a little bit of an obligation. So challenges uh, are obligatory and, response, and and opportunities abound. And I certainly, you know, share the, the, the thought of going forth and, and doing good work. So with that, I'm going to thank everyone for, for joining us today. There were many people on, on this Zoom who I could have shouted out to because of their work that they do in this area. Bonnie Harkin and Paul Brokers, a lot of people who are part of this conversation. Join us again when we next meet for a Green Cities event. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Nice.